Can you put a vegetable garden in your front yard? Absolutely yes. Hi guys, I'm April from Respreath. I did it, I became the crazy neighbor, and I caused pedestrians to do a dead stop at the end of my driveway over there, and I managed to grow 632 pounds of food last year, all in my front yard. So today, I'm gonna give you a quick summer tour, share some tips, do some harvesting along the way, and show you exactly how I plan on getting to my new goal of 1,000 pounds. First off, how awesome is it that this is my view when I come out my front door and it's right off my kitchen for my pre-dinner harvest. This is my perennial bed. Right now, this is my only perennial bed. I keep all of my pollinators in here too. I got some gorgeous lavender. This smells so amazing. I just rub my hands over it every time I walk out the door. I always check before I do that though so I don't grab a bee, seriously. <laughs> The bees are all over this stuff. They love it. With the cabbage moth, my arch nemesis. Next to the lavender, I have some echinacea, also called coneflower. My black-eyed Susans are in the back, which haven't bloomed yet. I got those as a transplant from my awesome mother-in-law. I'm a big tea drinker, so in the front here, I have a bunch of tea plants, Camellia sinensis. I have a couple at various ages. Tea is actually an evergreen plant, so my plan here is eventually to plant a whole bunch of these under my front window as a foundation planting, so my house will look somewhat normal. This is the soaker hose system I have running through most of my garden. I'll link that below, but let me know if you guys want to know more and I can do a set of video on that. These are a variety of raspberries called shortcake raspberries that are small bushes and I have these planted as a border. I just transplanted these though, so they look a little scraggly. They probably won't produce this year. Here's my current bush I inherited with the house. And some salvia next door to that. Bees love this stuff too once it blooms. So I have seven beds in my front yard. They're all three feet by 13 feet. I used to have four foot wide beds and I found they were way too deep to comfortably reach into and three feet is definitely the sweet spot for me. And because I'm a total nerd, I keep extensive records and I actually have a naming system for all the beds. The front garden is numbered one through seven, south to north, and the trellis area is labeled by letter, west to east. So this is bed seven, my beet bed this year. I have a large Japanese maple that shades this bed in the afternoon. So I always have to put crops in this bed that are a little shade tolerant. So this year it's beets. I haven't planted lettuce in quite a few years and beets are the reason why. Not only do the young leaves taste just like a really great butterhead lettuce, but the older leaves you can cook with like spinach you, they don't bolt in the heat when you most need salad greens to go with your tomatoes. And at the end of the season, you can pull them up and you get a crop of beets as a bonus. This year, I have two varieties, a red and a yellow variety. This red one, I think it's called Lutz. I'll put a full list of all the varieties and everything I mentioned today in the description below. Also, you'll see these all over my garden. Finally, after years of searching, I finally have the perfect plant marker system. These are stainless steel labels with clear labels that I make on a label maker. Uh, this variety is known for its great leaves in addition to its giant storage roots. I've planted this a few years in a row and it's definitely a keeper variety now. This other variety is a new variety for me called Touchstone Gold. It has yellow roots, which is handy if you don't feel like staining your entire dish bright pink just because you're trying to hide some veggies in there. Uh, you can definitely see just looking at the bed that the Lutz has much bigger leaves. I might look for another golden leaf intense variety next year if the Touchstone keeps these small leaves. Bed six is my strawberry bed. I have an ever-bearing variety in here called TriStar. I posted a video recently about planting these. I'll link that above. 
These are so young. I don't think I'm gonna get much this year, but they're sending out runners and getting established. So I'm excited what next year is gonna look like. Bed five is my potato bed. I have two varieties in here, a russet and a red. These finished flowering a couple weeks ago, so I can actually start harvesting now for new potatoes. So with the potatoes this year, I'm doing an experiment. I've been reading up on a continuous harvest planting method that basically turns potatoes from an annual into a perennial crop. So I'll let you guys know how that goes. Every year I have a miscellaneous bed and this year it's bed four. You can almost call it my Italian bed. I got some zucchini. I had some issues with blossom end rot because of the drought we were having. So hopefully that will clear up with our recent big thunderstorms. Look at this monster. This is what happens when you don't check your garden for one day after a thunderstorm. This is insane. Here's my basil. This is enough to keep me in basil all summer. And then I do a clear cutting harvest in the fall for my annual freezing of pesto. I'm gonna harvest some of this too, making sure I get the flowers so they'll keep growing. Next to that, I got my Napa cabbage. I have some sort of pest on here that my regular spraying of BT is not helping. If anyone has any ideas, let me know in the comments. I've been cutting the outer leaves of these almost daily for salads. These are giant though, look at these. It's probably time to take one of these. Here's my eggplant, which is just starting to flower. My fennel, which is almost ready to harvest. I'm gonna wait until it gets a little bigger though. I've been harvesting the fronds for salads for almost a month now. This is the bell peppers, which are just starting to flower too. I need to get out here and stake these and the eggplant soon. This is the garlic I planted in the fall. I made a video recently about harvesting the scapes, which I'll link above. This is another experiment I'm running. In my scape research, I ran across an anecdote that you should leave one scape to flower. And when it does, that will be your sign to harvest the garlic. So here's my one scape. It's been straightening up over the last week, so hopefully it will be time soon. This empty bed is bed three. I'm in the middle of turning that one over. I had some edamame in there that didn't germinate very well. I was planning on planting chard, but I had such a huge spinach harvest in March and I have the beets growing and some kale that's doing really well. So I'm thinking a bed of chard might be overdoing the greens a little bit. Let me know if you guys have some good ideas. Hit me up in the comments. Bed two, I am so excited about. I love, love, love broccoli, but I've always had huge issues with cabbage worms. This year I sprayed with BT only once and they are doing amazing, only a little bit of damage. These are probably a couple days past harvest, so I'm gonna grab some of these now. And I'm gonna harvest the whole bed for the freezer probably tomorrow and then turn that bed over into another broccoli crop for the fall. I have the broccoli seedlings already, which I'll show you guys in a minute. Bed one this year is my carrot bed. Again, this is another bed I'm super excited about. I've always had germination, pests, and weed issues in the past with carrots, and I've never gotten a good crop, but I got serious this year. So I'm gonna grab some of these carrots too. So my plan with this bed is to harvest as I need over the next month or so, then harvest the whole bed once they're big enough, store them, then plant another round of carrots, that I can start harvesting in the fall and then keep them in the ground all winter. If you guys watched my spinach harvesting video, you saw the whole winter garden setup I had last year. So I hope to be adding carrots to my winter garden collection. So that is my front garden area. I wouldn't call this my driveway garden, but this has become my container and seedling staging area. These are window boxes that I keep my herbs in. I had these indoors over the winter, so I was able to harvest all winter long. The plan is to mount them up under the front window and get some use out of the vertical space during the growing season. These are self-watering containers, and even in the heat of the summer, I only need to water these every three days. So in here, I got some chives, Italian oregano, bay, rosemary, thyme, Greek oregano, French tarragon, marjoram, 
garlic chives, sage, some parsley and cilantro that's gone to seed, and some dill that's been destroyed by a swallowtail caterpillar. Right now, this is where I'm keeping my seedlings. This area has worked out perfectly because there's a roof overhang here, so they don't get drowned by the rain, but I have great southern exposure here and I'm not killing any grass. This is my replacement cucumbers and some Napa cabbage. This was a great tip I got from Jean-Martin Fortier's book, The Market Gardener. Cucumbers are super prone to disease and inevitably die mid-season. So these are my replacement plants that I have ready to go that I seeded in early June. The Napa cabbage seedlings are going to replace those huge cabbages in bed four. These onions are going to replace the garlic when I harvest that. And this is my fall broccoli crop, which is going to fill up bed two when I harvest that later. And some radicchio that will go in bed four with the Napa seedlings. You'll notice I don't use the standard plastic flats. These are stainless steel trays, what the restaurant industry calls hotel pans or steam table pans. They come in different standardized sizes. This is the full size. You can buy these by the case. I like to use washable crayon to write varieties and dates on the side. Super easy to clean up, indestructible. You can sterilize them and you don't fill up the landfill with those flimsy junk flat trays. So that's my driveway garden, if you will. This is my trellis area on the side of my driveway here. I purposely put all the vertical crops over here because I didn't want them blocking the front of the house. This is my blueberry hedge. I have a bunch of varieties in here. Right now the birds are getting all of these. I had some bird netting here, but it actually killed a bird. So I pulled it off the day I found the body. Do not use this stuff. My plan is to, instead of the bird netting, to wrap these guys in some insect netting or row cover and see if that works a little better at um, keeping the birds away. So the beds over here, I number these by letters to keep them all straight. Beds A and B are my new blackberry trellises. I just finished up a video on this build if you guys wanna see how I made these. Bed C is my cucumber row. All the rows here are 13 feet long and two feet wide, except the blackberry beds, which are three feet wide. I got an insane amount of cucumbers last year, 150 pounds, and I attribute that entirely to the varieties that I had. I've tried at least 10 varieties over the years, and these two varieties, Saber and Market More, are disease resistant and hardy when all the other varieties next to it were already dead. But yeah, after getting that many cucumbers, we downsized from two trellises to one trellis. I have a couple open spots where a cucumber plant died, so I'm gonna pop in some of those starts that I have in the driveway. And the rest of the starts, I'll probably pot up since they're getting big. This row is a row of damsel slicing tomatoes. I started super late. I did my math wrong when I was starting the seedlings and found out I was short by a whole row when I planted them out. Because these plants are so young though, you can see the spacing a little better. This is how I space all the plants in the trellis area. One row on either side of the trellis, a plant every 12 inches with the placement staggered so the plant is not directly across from the other. That gives each plant roughly 12 square inches of spacing. And this trellis netting has six inch squares, which means each plant has their own vertical line to go up. And I make sure to prune them to one liter. And then I get that soaker hose going down the middle between the two plants. You can see the size difference between this row and the other tomato row next door. This is what 53 days difference looks like. I started these cherry tomatoes on March 29th and the damsels late on May 22nd. I have two cherry tomato varieties in here. This one is Montesino, which is a new one for me this year. This one is taller by almost a foot, and this is the first tomato that is going to be ready. Check this out. I try to come out here every day or every other day and pull off the suckers and keep weaving the tops of the tomatoes back and forth between the trellis. You definitely gotta keep on top of it.
So I have four total rows of tomatoes, the first slicer row, the cherry tomato row, a paste tomato row, and another slicer row. 13 feet rows with two across at 12 inch spacing, so 26 plants per row and a total of 104 plants. This keeps us in tomatoes every day during the season. And last year I was able to can 12 jars of sauce. Hopefully this year I can do a bit more. People ask me all the time, what do I do with all of this food? And I say, I eat it. <laughs> it's called Italian food. <laughs> Most of the rows I have two varieties in. I try to keep one good variety from the year before and then test a new variety. Like you can see in this row, the two varieties are clearly different. This is a bed I just cleared my spring peas out of. There's some sort of volunteer squash back there. I'll probably leave him there. I just prepped this bed a few days ago and I'm gonna direct seed some green beans in there for fall. And this is my fourth tomato row, the paste tomato row. Unless there's a tomato emergency, I don't eat these during the season. I freeze them and then can them later for sauce when I have a spare minute. And this is my miscellaneous bed in my trellis area. Check this out. I got a little baby butternut squash already. Squash does not like to be trellis, so you have to be very firm with it. Prune it to one liter or it will sprawl all over the ground, which is how it likes to grow. And just like the tomatoes, you gotta come through every couple days, wrap it around the trellis in the right spot to keep it on target or it will just pick its own direction. Here's some pumpkin. This is a variety that's good for both the flesh and for hollis seeds. Some sweet corn on the end here. This tends to fall over, so that's why I got it here in the trellis area so I can tie it up when I need to. This is my watermelon row with another volunteer squash in there. Same rules apply with the trellising, gotta be firm. Check this out, I already got some mini watermelons here. See, these things are crazy. These trellises are about seven feet high and the watermelon's already at the top going sideways now. And because I didn't correct it early on, it's too late to argue with it. I'm not gonna rip them down. This one's getting pretty heavy, so I need to get some support hammocks out here soon. I have a pile of cut up t-shirts I use to create hammocks that I tie to the trellis so the watermelon doesn't pull itself off the vine from just the sheer weight of itself. Down here, I got some super young watermelons. I had some seed supply issues this year because of the pandemic, so I had to direct sow these super late. I have no idea if it's even gonna work out. We will see. This last row, my cantaloupe row, same issue, had to direct sow some seeds late. And these are the more mature cantaloupe that were started on time. These guys like to sprawl too, so you have to be on top of the trellising if you're gonna do them vertically. And here's them sprawling. These last two rows always look a little more pathetic because they get quite a bit of shade from this elm tree in the first half of the day. I might be taking this down soon, unfortunately. Once I do that, I'm hoping to do something with this space here, either a greenhouse or some espaliered fruit trees. I think I can squeeze maybe three to four rows of espaliered fruit here. Let me know what you guys think. I'm torn. Greenhouse, fruit, I don't know. I want them both. <laughs> Back here is my fence bed. This is a new bed. I actually created it in an hour from this sad expanse of compacted crabgrass. It does get a little shade from the fence and the trellises, so I thought this would be a good spot for some summer greens and that the summer greens would probably appreciate the shade. So I got all of my kale here. Between this and the cabbage and the beet greens, I can make two big salads a day. Oh, and then also I have random greens, like the broccoli leaves from the broccoli plants, and I have some volunteer arugula in my foundation bed too. So yeah, we got plenty of salad. And then over here, this is the first time I'm doing this. This is peanuts. Probably not the best spot for them because they like a lot of sun, but that's the only space I had left, so we're gonna see how that goes. I got some old shrubs I need to dig up and then I can continue this bed the full length of the fence. I should be able to triple the length of this bed when I finally get around to doing that. 
And that is the trellis half of my garden. If you can believe it, when we bought this house, there were five huge mature trees here and it was full shade every part of the day. It was dark and dreary and even the grass didn't grow. When I tried to mow it, it would actually become a dust storm. It was awful. Everyone told us that we should put a driveway turnaround here, like the world needs more space devoted to paved parking. And now look at this life. It is so amazing. I am so happy. And it this is the area that makes people stand at the end of my driveway and point. And check this out. This is everything we harvested today. If you enjoyed this tour, let me know by hitting that like button. Questions, tips, just wanna make fun of my obsession with black? Hit me up in the comments. Be sure to subscribe for more garden tips and tutorials. If you know anybody who would be interested in this video, please share it with them, and I would love to stay connected with you guys, so sign up for my email newsletter. Keep gardening like a boss, and I'll see you guys soon.